I'm very excited to introduce the next speaker. Dr. Dick Winchelbaum is a professor of cancer genomics research and professor of pharmacology and medicine at Mayo Clinic. He received his medical degree from the University of Kansas and completed internship and residency at Mass General. Additionally, he completed a pharmacology training program here at the NIH with the Nobel laureate, Dr. Julius Axelrod. Dr. Winchelbaum has devoted his career to the study of individualized drug therapy. His research focuses on the utilization of genomic techniques that include genome-wide association studies, next-generation whole gen genome DNA sequencing in patients with cancer and depression. He's received numerous awards and honors in the field of pharmacology, including ASPET's Harry Gold Award for Clinical Pharmacology and the Oscar B. Hunter Award from ASCPT for a Career Scientific Accomplishments. I'm confident you will enjoy today's lecture. Hello, I'm Dick Winchelbaum, Professor of Pharmacology and Medicine at the Mayo Clinic and Mayo Medical School. It's a real pleasure to take part in this series because what we're seeing is an evolutionary process for the discipline of clinical pharmacology. Uh, my topic today is pharmacometabolomics and clinical pharmacology. As someone who's devoted my entire career to what was pharmacogenetics and then evolved into pharmacogenomics, it's really interesting to see the further evolution of omic science as applied to clinical pharmacology. And I think we can take pride in the fact that clinical pharmacology has taken a leadership role in terms of bringing omic science to drug response phenotypes. This first slide, the title slide, Pharmacometabolomics and Clinical Pharmacology, really those little logos at the bottom are there for a reason. Uh, at the left-hand side, uh, what you can see is that little thing that looks like a, a tooth fairy or something. That is the logo for the Center for Individualized Medicine at the, at the Mayo Clinic. And over on your right is the logo for the NIH Pharmacogenomics Research Network. And those are there to make the point that really what we're engaged in, all of us, is a partnership between the National Institutes of Health, which is frankly one of the great social inventions that this country has produced, which catalyzes change, but it's a partnership with all of our academic medical centers. Uh, I just used the Mayo Clinic as one example. Uh, in order to bring the latest science to the bedside to try and benefit patients everywhere. In the middle, you see uh, that thing that looks like sort of an explosion. That's the logo for the NIH Pharmacometabolomics Network, which I w have been a part of since it began. And that IMS thing is the logo for the Recon Center for Genomics. And, and basically, that's to make the point that what we're engaged in here is an international collaborative and cooperative effort to move the science forward. That said, I teach medical students and graduate students and postdoctoral fellows all the time, so I have an outline. Uh, I promise you there will not be a post-test unless the NIH comes up with one, and I'm going to make a few introductory comments. I'm going to very briefly talk about metabolomics, a, a brief overview, and then the focus here, since after all this is a clinical pharmacology lecture series, is pharmacometabolomics informed pharmacogenomics as applied to drug response phenotypes, and then a few concluding comments. So pharmacogenomics and pharmacometabolomics are critical components of what is today referred to as personalized, individualized, or since President Obama's uh, 2015 State of the Union address, precision medicine. We all know what the clinical goals of pharmacogenomics and pharmacometabolomics are. Number one, to help us, first of all, avoid harm, to avoid adverse drug reactions, because the drugs we use today are not placebos. They're powerful agents. Many of them are highly targeted, but they also can do great harm in addition to great good. So our first responsibility is to avoid adverse drug reactions. Number two, they work. They're not placebos. So we want to maximize drug efficacy. And finally, at the bottom, select responsive patients right at the very beginning so we can avoid churning in the system and going uh, on a purely uh, a hit or miss fashion from one drug to another. There's a science here, though, too. There are scientific goals to both of these disciplines. First of all, to link genomic and metabolomic variation to phenotypic variation, the phenotypes being what I outlined on the immediately preceding slide. Second, 
and I've highlighted this, this is a science. We are scientists engaged in trying to understand underlying mechanisms or to determine the mechanisms responsible for that link. And I'll give you a couple of examples before we're done here. And finally, we're physicians. So we want to translate that link into enhanced diagnosis, treatment, and prevention of disease. And that applies to PharmDs, it applies to PhDs who are engaged in clinical pharmacology, and it applies to those of us who have MD or MD-PhD degrees. So what is this broad topic that I'll be speaking about for the remainder of this presentation? It is, as I said at the beginning, the application of omic science in order to study variation in drug response phenotypes, and once we understand it, to bring that understanding to the bedside. Here's my view of the evolution of pharmacogenetics into pharmacoomics, which would include pharmacometabolomics. We begin with what my medical students tell me are those boring cytochrome P450 drug metabolizing enzymes, and why was that? because at the beginning, these were candidate genes and we knew that blood drug levels were related to the outcomes of drug therapy. And so that was where our focus was, was on drug transporters, uh, genes encoding drug transporters, genes encoding drug metabolizing enzymes. At the beginning of, of this century, we began to have the ability to move beyond candidates that we knew on the basis of biochemical studies to pharma, what I've called pharmacogenomics here, that is unbiased genome-wide studies. Uh, frankly, when I began doing this, no one had cloned any gene. I know that's hard for many of you to believe, but uh, that's actually where this field came from. Now we can scan an unbiased passion across the genome, and what we find is all kinds of genes that we had never thought of before, with names we had never heard, and I'll show you examples of that before we're done today, that have an important re uh, effect on drug response phenotypes. And finally, what we have now learned is that genomics is not, all, DNA sequence is not everything. And we need to bring in metabolomics, transcriptomics, proteomics, and multiple omics. So with that background, let's focus briefly on metabolomics, just a brief overview. So here is this little, uh, uh, this little ladder that even the Mayo medical students, whom I abused terribly, would know. That is, DNA, now that is the genome, uh, encodes messenger RNA, the transcriptome, which encodes proteins, that's proteomics, and the proteins do things, and that's metabolomics, and the metabolites are right up against the clinical phenotypes. That presents an opportunity, but also significant challenges if we're going to bring all of these omics together and bring them to bear on drug response phenotypes. What do we do in metabolomics? We use the assays that generally will go right back uh, to uh, liquid chromatography or high performance liquid chromatography or ultra high performance cr liquid chromatography. It gives us the ability to simultaneously assay a large number of small molecules in biological samples of all sorts, in plasma, of course, in cerebrospinal fluid, in lysates of cells, et cetera. So first we've got to separate those small molecules, and that's where gas chromatography, li liquid chromatography, et cetera, are used. We need to quantify them, and we'll come back to that in a minute by the use of standards. And then we need to identify them, because at first they're just a peak coming off of, a, of an LC. And we can do that with NMR, and generally it's done with tandem mass spectrometry. So a whole series of things that all of you are familiar with already. The ideal platform for metabolomics has great sensitivity, it's quantitative, and it has broad specificity. It enables you to look at a variety of different kinds of compounds. There'll be endless debates about uh, what platform to use, and what I would suggest to most of you is that your academic medical center, like mine, will have a center for metabolomics, that is a core, and you need to go and get advice with regard to the particular problem that you're looking at. I recently received a grant to begin to study drugs that are used in alcohol use disorder, and we sat down and had exactly that discussion with our core metabolomic center with regard to the platforms that are available, focusing on quantitative platforms with high sensitivity, and it will be a different detection system depending on the, on the nature of the small molecules that you want to identify. I'm gonna show you just a couple of examples 
of the application of metabolomics to make some points that, uh, that may seem obvious but weren't so obvious to begin with. Here's a, a metabolomic study of 131 metabolites in some fairly large populations of women and men. And notice one of them was 1,400 men and 1,500 women. <coughs> and this was a broad metabolomics, but it was quantitative, 131 metabolites. And by using principal components analysis, you can sort out rather striking differences looking at the principal components analysis on your left and on your right, there's the two populations. One was the original large population, then a replication population, showing that the blue dots are different than the green dots, and this is making the point that the metabolomics profiles in men and women differ. Now, we've all been to medical school or graduate school, so I think we know that there is a difference between boys and girls, but I think we need to bear this in mind, hold this thought, because I'm going to come back at the end and make a point that this became very important when we were trying to use metabolomics to study patients with major depressive disorder, two-thirds of whom are women. Uh, this is talking about, uh, the next slide will just give you some idea of uh, me uh, metabolic individuality. And here we're looking at uh, some of the same populations and some different populations. Now we're up to 250 metabolites and over 60 metabolic pathways. And what was done here was to do GWAS to identify genes associated with variation in the metabolite. Hold that thought because I'm going to come back to that at the end of this presentation when I use major depressive disorder as an example of the application of genomics put together with metabolomics to give us novel insights into the underlying pathophysiology of a disease and response to therapy. And what you can see here, I've just picked these examples because they happen to be among some of the boring stuff that I lecture on drug metabolism on to our medical students and graduate students. If you use bilirubin as a metabolite that, uh, and look for the gene the variants in a gene, the SNPs, that were most highly associated with variation in plasma bilirubin, guess what? It was in the UGT1A1 gene uh, with a p-value notice of 3 times 10 to the minus 74th power. Uh, for androsterone sulfate, it was cytochrome P453A4. And for caffeine, which I would guess that many of you have already had today as you've watched this lecture, it was a SNP uh, near the AHR gene with a p-value of 10 to the minus 15th. So this is an example of taking the metabolite concentration as a phenotype and then doing genome-wide association study to ask the question, are there genes that are associated with the variation in the metabolite? And if the concentration of metabolite is associated with the uh, uh, disease phenotype or drug response phenotype you're interested in, you can find what underlying genes and SNPs are related to that variation in the metabolite. And I put this here as a, an introduction to what I'm going to show you later. Now with that as background, using variation and concentration of metabolites as a way to begin to understand variation in the patients we're looking at, and in our case, variations in drug response phenotypes, let's talk about how metabolomics can inform genomics. Now, I, I said just a moment ago that my entire career has been devoted to DNA sequence variation and its relationship to variation in drug response phenotypes. Now what we'll talk about is how we can use other omics information to inform the genomic analysis and give us, provide us insights that we couldn't have otherwise had. So what are the challenges? Well, there are a lot of challenges, but one of them is how do you actually, in real life terms, merge metabolomic information with genomics and other omics, transcriptomics, proteomics? Number two, when we look at metabolomics, we can obviously extract uh, metabolites from cytosol in cells. Uh, we can look at plasma but most often it, it will be plasma metabolites, and that's the end result of a variety of inputs from a variety of organs. How do we relate that to a specific organ? And uh, the, since I told you that the example I'll use is for major depressive disorder, how do, what does that have to do anyway 
with what's going on in the brain. And I can tell you that psychiatrists are uh, concerned that uh, what is looked at in the periphery in terms of metabolomics or transcriptomics might have nothing whatsoever to do with what's going on in the brain. So hold these thoughts. There actually is um, a method to the madness, and we're going to come back and put these challenges together and address them individually. So let's begin with one study of major depressive disorder. This is the number one psychiatric disease worldwide, lifetime risk in vir virtually every population of about 15%. And uh, clearly, it's a, it's a disease that we don't talk about as much as we do breast cancer or coronary artery disease because of the stigma that's associated with psychiatric disease. Here's a study. This is so common that we could do this study entirely in Olmstead County, Minnesota, uh, where the Mayo Clinic in, in Rochester is, is based. 800 patients with major depressive disorder. How did the psychiatrists currently, how did they determine how severe the major depressive disorder is? Do they have a blood test that they can do? And you know that the answer is no. They ask a patient questions about his or her mood. They ask about sleep patterns. They ask about sex life and sex behavior, and then assign a score. And you do not want to get a high score on this test because the higher the number, the more severely depressed the patients are. This is the Quick Inventory of Depressive Symptomatology, or the Hamilton D. These are, you ask questions in order to determine how ill your patient is. What was done in this case was to have four psychiatrists, it was always the same four, see these patients, and determine quids and HAMD at baseline at four weeks and at eight weeks. And then we did genome-wide genotyping. And first, gc toft that is, so gas chromatography, time of flight mass spectrometry. And then LC electrochemical array, which is very sensitive for neurotransmitters and neurotransmitter metabolites on 300 of these 800 patients. Now remember, it's three time points. And what that meant was that it was over a 1,000 samples, and I can tell you it was an extremely expensive study to get both the GWAS genotyping and the metabolomics on just these 300 out of the 800 patients. And what was the approach? We looked for metabolomic signatures, then we analyzed pathways and determined which metabolite was related to what the psychiatrists were measuring, that is change in Hamilton D or change in quids, in the first studies, before we had genome-wide data, we did tag SNP determination and then functional validation of any SNPs or genes that we saw. Later, we could go across the whole genome using GWAS. So I'm going to show you the way our understanding of these patients evolved over time. What we found was that glycine was the metabolite that appeared to be most highly associated with <coughs> with response to SSRI therapy. And I'm just showing you here, response for most of these psychiatric studies means that your quids or HAMD decreases by 50%. And remember, a high score is bad, so you want it to decrease when you treat. Remission means that it goes for the quids to a value of less than five, for the Hamilton D, a value of less than seven. Our chair of psychiatry at the time we did this study explained that a quids of less than five is happier than any Mayo Clinic doctor is on Monday morning. Now, I don't know what he meant when he said that, but I think I can guess. So you can see that, that we're looking at what happens with baseline glycine levels and its relationship to these phenotypes, response and remission. And it appeared that change in glycine was associated with response and was nearly significantly associated with remission, just taking the extremes of response and remission we could then go back to the pathway whereby glycine is synthesized and metabolized and do tag SNPs across all these genes that I have listed here. And one of those genes, uh, which we won't bother you with, showed that it had a series of SNPs that were related to response to SSRI therapy. So this is, this is the, the Neolithic period of five years ago when this study was done. And we published this study in Clinical Pharmacology and Therapeutics, uh, as you can see on the bottom of the slide, in 2014. And this just shows you the, what we, this was a beginning to move toward taking a genome-wide approach. 
to take a genome-wide approach, we did genome-wide GWAS genotyping, SNP genotyping, out of about 600,000 SNPs and imputed that to 7 million. So now we've got 7 million SNPs on each of these patients, and we used a different metabolomics platform, uh, getting uh, 900 samples on 300 of these patients, and only using about 37 metabolites, but with high degree of sensitivity for monoamine neurotransmitters like serotonin and the catecholamines. This work was done by Dr. Wayne Madsen in Bedford, Massachusetts. So now we're going beyond just a few SNPs, that is tag SNPs across a pathway, and we're gonna look across the whole genome. Looking at variation in the metabolites, determining how that variation is associated with variation in response to SSRIs, and then saying what are the genes that are, respond, that are associated with this variation in response, to, uh, in response to SSRI therapy. And lo and behold, what we found was, and, and I just put this up here so you can see I've got remission, response, percent change in quids. This happens to be with the, with the quids. At baseline, after four weeks of SSRI therapy, after eight weeks of SSRI therapy, and the, the plasma metabolite that was most closely associated with response to, uh, among depressed patients, to selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors was plasma serotonin. And I said, this is too good to be true, but as a matter of fact, it actually was true. And these are all nominal p-values because we're now going to go back and select serotonin to do a genome-wide association study. So what this slide shows is that variation in plasma serotonin appeared to be very closely associated with who was and who was not going to have the remission or response or percent change in remission response to SSRI therapy. And that was determined purely by asking the patients questions about their mood, about their sleep pattern, and about their sex life. This slide shows you what happens to plasma serotonin after both four weeks and eight weeks of exposure to SSR SSRIs. It drops precipitously, that makes sense because plasma serotonin predominantly comes first from the gut, but the platelets take up the serotonin from enterochromaffin cells in the gut and store the serotonin. And what we basically are doing is directly inhibiting that uptake process, which is the target of the SSRIs. So as you think about it, it shouldn't have been surprising that plasma serotonin concentration might be highly associated with what serotonin reuptake inhibitors might do. Now looking in the periphery, not in the brain, and we'll come back to that in just a minute, because clearly that's one of the worries that the psychiatrists have. I just want to review with you a sort of slide that I would show to the Mayo Medical students. That is, this is, where does serotonin come from? It is a metabolite of the amino acid tryptophan, L-tryptophan. About 5% of the tryptophan goes down the pathway going to serotonin. 95% to kynurenine, and both of these pathways can affect in the central nervous system, uh, neurotransmitter system. Serotonin obviously can affect serotonergic neurotransmission, and kynurenine will interfere with glutamatergic neurotransmission. And if you were male medical students, rather than the very sophisticated audience whom I'm addressing, I would say for the medical students, serotonin good, kynurenine bad. Now that's a gross oversimplification, but it, it may help a bit in terms of thinking about where we're going next. So what did we do? On these 300 patients, we then did a genome-wide association study on baseline plasma serotonin, serotonin uh, at four weeks, at eight weeks, change in serotonin, and what did our statisticians tell us? They tell, told us what the statisticians always tell us, you are underpowered and you are doomed. This cannot possibly work. You will not find any genome-wide significant hits. And to their terrible disappointment, we actually found two hits, one that was genome-wide significant in this gene T-span 5 with a p-value of about 8 times 10 to the minus 9th, and E-rich 3, which was close to genome-wide significant, and 9 times 10 to the minus 8th. Uh, nominal genome-wide significance is 5 times 10 to the minus 8th. I would assume that nobody in this audience had ever heard of T-SPAN5 or E-RICH3 
before the, you saw this slide. I certainly, I never had. Actually, you rich three at the time we did the study didn't even have a name. It was just uh, annotated as an open reading frame. So what are these genes that none of us had ever heard of? Well, first of all, why could we find this signal in only 300 subjects, which of course horrified the statisticians? It's because it, the p-value depends on the minor allele frequency and the effect size. How big is the effect size? What I'm showing you on this slide is if you look at the ERICH3 SNPs, the genotypes, for low and high serotonin, and the T-SPAN5 SNPs for plasma serotonin, and put them together, the difference between being homozygous for the low serotonin SNPs in both genes or the high serotonin SNPs in both genes is tenfold. We are not looking at an effect size of 1.05. We're looking at a tenfold effect size. So clearly, these genes have a very major role in terms of determining the variation in plasma serotonin. We'll come back to why that might be in just a moment. What I'm showing you here are so-called locus zooms, or regional plots. And you're looking at your left at the a plot of the SNPs that we had after imputation in the GWAS across the ERICH3 gene, and on your right at the SNPs that were 5 prime, that is just upstream, of the T-SPAN5 gene. So for T-SPAN5, these SNPs were so-called expression quantitative trait loci, translated into English. That means they are associated with variation in the expression of the gene, that is the messenger RNA uh, that is made from this gene, depending on your genotype. The SNPs in ERICH3, as I'll show you in a minute, were non-synonymous SNPs. They were, there were two of them that changed the encoded amino acid sequence. And one of the common things that happens if you change encoded amino acid sequence is the protein misfolds and is rapidly degraded. And that's what happens to ERICH3. So these SNPs basically for ERICH3 represent, if you have two copies of the variant, they represent a knockout of the ERICH3 gene. Now let's go to what bothers the psychiatrist. They're going to say immediately, what's in the plasma? What does that have to do with the brain anyway? Well, in today's world, we now have something called GTEx, which is a database where you can go and look at human tissues obtained soon after death, rapid autopsy, in patients who generally died in automobile accidents or motorcycle accidents, in which the tissue, they got informed consent was taken, and RNA-seq was done on these tissues. And all you really need to know, looking at this slide, is yellow is different areas of the brain. And this is showing you which tissues T-SPAN5 is expressed in, and it's mainly expressed, even though we found it in peripheral plasma, it's mainly expressed in multiple areas of the brain. You can see the yellow little boxes are very, very high expression of T-SPAN5. So what we saw in the periphery get, told us about a gene that's mainly expressed in the central nervous system. And ERICH3 is even more dramatic. ERICH3 is predominantly expressed, once again, in different regions. These are just different regional areas of the brain in the human brain. So what we saw in the periphery is telling us something about variation that may be occurring in the brain. I put this up just to, to take you back to, with sheer horror, to those lectures on tryptophan pathway metabolism, just to point out that to get serotonin, you have to go through tryptophan hydroxylase 1 and 2 and dopa decarboxylase, and eventually you get serotonin. And then that can be metabolized by monoamine oxidase, et cetera, taking you back to very early pharmacology lectures, either in graduate school or in medical school. So what we did was take a neuronally derived cell line, the neuroblastoma, and we knocked down an overexpressed T-SPAN5. And if you look over at the left, you can see that tryptophan hydroxylase 1 and 2 and dopa decarboxylase. If you knock down T-SPAN5, these biosynthetic enzymes that make serotonin go down. If you overexpress T-SPAN5, they go up. So you don't just find a signal. You want to functionally validate. It's not a replication, but functionally validate what this might have to do with, in our case, serotonin levels. It looks like what happens here is T-SPAN5 is playing a role in the biosynthesis and degradation of a serotonin. For ERICH3, what you're seeing here are Western blots where we could take the ERICH3 gene and find an example, a construct 
that had the variant, this L1056B, and just express it in the mammalian cell. And what you see is that the protein is way down, and in the bottom of your, uh, at the lower right, you can see that if you then block, uh, uh, if you then uh, uh, block the proteasome, which degrades misfolded protein, is right in the middle there, uh, that you can prevent the degradation of the protein. So the ERIGH3 SNP is a non-synonymous SNP, changes the encoded amino acid, and that apparently leads to rapid degradation of ERIGH3. And if you take those ERIGH3 SNPs and look at other SSRI studies, and ISPC is an international uh, SSRI uh, consortium with about 1,000 patients that we put together, those SNPs were related to outcome to outcome in that study and in something called STAR-D, which was another study that had about 1,200 patients who were Caucasians and similar to our patients. Now, remember, the GWAS was done for plasma serotonin, but the SNPs we found on the GWAS are associated with outcomes in these studies. And I can tell you, they've been replicated in something called the MARS study, a Munich study of depression too. So we have replicated these, at least the rich three SNPs in three other studies. Let's look at baseline severity of, of uh, symptomatology because we had metabolites at baseline and we could look at the Hamilton D in the quiz and say, which metabolite is just related to how severe the symptoms were, how high the Ham D or quiz score was at baseline. And right at the top of the list was kynurenine and I showed you that metabolism that came down from tryptophan to serotonin on the other side of the, of the pathway was kynurenine. And you can see that uh, this was the number one metabolite variation in plasma kynurenine metabolism. And plasma kynurenine concentration appeared to be most closely related to the metabolites that we examined in this, in this study uh, with severity of depressive symptoms as determined by asking questions about mood, questions about sleep, questions about your sex life. So we did a GWAS for baseline plasma kynurenine, and the number one hit was not genome-wide significant, its p-value uh, was about 10 to the minus seventh, but it was in a gene called DEFB1. Now, I didn't know what that gene was. There may be somebody in the, in the audience looking at this who knows, but when you look at the plasma kynurenine concentration, there was another signal in the AHR gene. You can see that this also is related. Uh, the two genes are related to plasma kynurenine concentration, but there's not a tenfold difference if you're homozygous for low uh, kynurenine versus high kynurenine SNPs. It's only about a twofold difference. DEFB1, what is this thing? It's a beta defensin. What, is it? what are defensins? These are small peptides that are generally encoded by genes that are found in the intestinal mucosa, and that's where DEFB1 is located. And what, do the, what does DEFB1 do? It interacts directly with bacteria and bores holes in the bacterial cell wall, and it also inactivates LPS. And everyone who's been to medical school or graduate school knows that you don't want a lot of LPS floating around in your plasma. That's associated with endoplasmic uh, with, with shock, and uh, clearly this is a way for the body to protect itself. So wait a minute, I can see the, psychiatry, uh, uh, the psychiatrist in the audience saying, what in the world does the gut have to do with the brain and in today's world of the microbiome? We know that there is absolutely no doubt that there is a gut-brain axis and is diagrammed uh, uh, schematically here, we're showing that basically what DEFB1 does is inactivate certain bacteria in the gut and also inactivate LPS. That probably has something to do directly with the tryptophan to kynurenine pathway, and we know that it does. We have experimental evidence that it does. And so what the world is now showing us, and what I think of all the omics, the one that, that has surprised me the most, is the rapidity with which the microbiome has been shown to have profound effects throughout our bodies and that we need to be thinking along these lines irrespective of what the underlying pathophysiology is that we're studying. And this is just an experiment done in the lab to show you that, uh, that you can make the kynurenine go down if you can add 
uh, DEF B1 to LPS, and that the tryptophan goes up. It's just making the point that indeed functionally, DEF B1 is playing a role in tryptophan and kynurinine metabolism. And if we took those SNPs from DEF B1, which were related to the concentration of kynurinine, guess what? They were directly related to the Hamilton D and Quid scores uh, statistically significantly when we went back and looked at the patients. There's no reason why uh, something that you find in a kynurinine uh, GWAS should be related to the change in HAMD or the severity of HAMD or quid scores uh, in psychiatric patients. So what have we done here? I've shown you use of metabolomics to inform genomics for two metabolites that were highly related to a clinical phenotype, either severity of depressive symptoms or response to SSRI therapy, and we have ERICH3, T-SPAN5, DEFB1, AHR, all right? Now, where are we going to go with this? And I'm going to carry you now into the world of artificial intelligence, machine learning, and what uh, people like to call now augmented human intelligence, because artificial intelligence sounds like the robots are going to take over the world, and augmented human intelligence uh, is a little less threatening. But let's go here first. I am not a psychiatrist. I did my research training with a man named Julius Axelrod at the National Institute of Mental Health, and I bought his champagne the morning he won the Nobel Prize for discovering the neural membrane reuptake mechanism that the SSRIs block. So I can tell you it's, it's actually quite rewarding to come back uh, decades later and be able to look at the basic mechanisms uh, of how these SSRI drugs work. But, this is from a real psychiatrist, the head psychiatrist for the United States in, in one way, a man named Tom Insel in 2013 when the uh, DSM-5, and the DSM, as those of you who went to medical school know, is the Bible of psychiatry. I think psychiatrists sleep with the DSM under their pillow. And here's what, here's what the head of the National Institute of Mental Health said in 2013. He said, unlike heart disease or lipid disorders where you can measure lipoproteins in the blood or AIDS where you can directly measure the virus. Psychiatric diagnoses are based on a cluster of clinical symptoms without any underlying biological, he says, objective laboratory measure. And I think his last sentence deserves to be highlighted, patients with mental illness deserve better. So what you're seeing here is an attempt to bring metabolites and genomics to bear on in the same way in psychiatric disease that we do for cancer and we do for coronary artery disease. <clears throat> so what did we do with the information we had in these 800 patients? Well, we collaborated with computer science department at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. Those of you on the West Coast are going to be blissfully unaware of this, but Netscape did not come from Silicon Valley. It came from the cornfields of Illinois and uh, from the Department of Computer Science there. And using hierarchical clustering, then said, can we begin to cluster patients with major depressive disorder into different groups? And can we begin to predict who will and will not respond to uh, SSRI therapy in a way that could be used in the clinic? So what this slide shows is that, first of all, it was abundantly obvious using these machine learning and artificial intelligence techniques that you had to deal with men and women separately. That takes us back to what I showed you right at the beginning, the difference in the metabolic profiles of men and women. If you separated the men from the women, you could reproducibly, both in our study and in the uh, other studies that I showed you, the uh, ISPC, and the STAR-D study separate patients with major depressive disorder into three separate groups, uh, referred to here as A1, A2, A3, and even follow them through therapy. Now, do I understand how the neural networks did this? Not a clue, but I'm sure there's some computer scientist sitting there snickering saying, well, it's obvious how that, that might work. And if you then apply this, you can go, if you use the clinical symptoms alone, your accuracy in, in predicting who will respond to SSRIs is about 
better than flipping a coin, but only marginally better. Certainly nothing we could use clinically. If you apply these predictive algorithms that come out of the machine learning world and the artificial intelligence world and separate men from women, you can determine with an accuracy of about 80 to 85 to 90 percent in both men and women who's going to respond. Remember that in order to get ketamine, which is used only in patients who fail on SSRI therapy, in our ketamine clinic, you have to fail on three different SSRIs. It takes two months to know whether the SSRIs work. That means in a potentially suicidal patient, you might wait six months before giving the ketamine. If this algorithm, which is replicated now in a series of studies, by the way, it replicates in the Mars study in Germany also, if it gives you a high degree of prediction accuracy, this patient is not going to respond to SSRIs. I think what the day will come soon when you will move directly to ketamine, which in patients who have failed on SSRIs, about 70% of them will respond to ketamine infusion therapy. That has immediate clinical implications. And here's a paper that was published just this month, August 2018, which is when I'm making this tape, in the IEEE Computational Intelligence talking about the use of these machine learning techniques and their application to SSRI response. Now, uh, IEEE, for those of you like me who had no idea what that meant, that's the Institute for Electronic and Electrical Engineering. And I have to say, it probably embarrasses the electrical engineers that I'm one of the co-authors of this paper. I never thought I would be publishing in an IEEE journal. So there's another point here. In today's world, we don't just need to move beyond genomics to include transcriptomics and proteomics and metabolomics. We need to have the computational tools that will enable us to deal with these large data sets in ways that can give us, provide novel insights. So let's conclude. Pharmacogenomics and pharmacometabolomics are not just stuck with the boring cytochromes B450 and phase two drug metabolizing enzymes and transporters that I teach about in my drug metabolism course. We are going to move very rapidly beyond pharmacokinetics to pharmacodynamics and mechanistic studies that will take us through all of biology. At the genomic level, we clearly are going to move beyond the open reading frame and the vast majority of the SNPs that are significant that we find on GWAS in our studies and other are not SNPs that change the encoded amino acid, not these non-synonymous SNPs that we have in ERICH3, but they're more like what we saw in T-SPAN5. They generally will alter transcription of the gene. We're going to have large and expensive multiple omics data sets that go beyond genomics, which was horrendously expensive if you wanted to go genome-wide, and will include metabolomics, transcriptomics, proteomics, and the microbiome. And we need to reach out for complementary expertise, especially computational expertise. And that requires cross-disciplinary dialogue where we think we know what the other person is saying and where they really are saying something quite different. So what are we talking about with these multiple omics? The application of omic science to study variation in drug response phenotypes, and this is an absolutely critical component of precision medicine and clinical pharmacology, I have no doubt, will lead the way in terms of bringing this type of knowledge to bear on drug response in, a variety, in every possible clinical setting. Finally, I want to show this. This is last year's slide showing my laboratory and my uh, colleague, Dr. Li Wei Wong, uh, stand, uh, the two of us standing on either side of one of our T32 clinical pharmacology trainees, who I'm happy to say is off in a pharmacy school teaching pharmacogenomics as we speak. And uh, if this slide does not look like your image of Minnesota, that I think that that says good. We're attracting the best and the brightest minds from all over the world to come to some place where the ground is covered with snow six months out of the year. It's been a real pleasure to participate in this series, uh, a pleasure and an honor, uh, and I'm looking forward to seeing the other lectures in this series. Thank you very much.